Good morning, everybody. I'm going to hit you with a little bit of an engine performance practice test. I know some people like to use these to prepare for ASC tests, and I get a lot of reports from people that have actually passed their ASC tests, and for some reason they are generous enough to uh, give these videos credit for helping them with that. Um, there's all manner of studies you can do. I don't, I don't, not, I've never studied for an ASC test, but I've never failed one. Most of the time it's got to do with just kind of knowing your stuff and knowing how those people think, you know, because uh, those questions can sometimes be kind of tough, particularly when they've got tables of data that you're supposed to go through to figure out what kind of answer they're wanting. Uh, but let's see if we can whip through some questions here. The washer around the base of some spark plugs is there for the primary purpose of what? Preventing compression loss, conducting heat out of the spark plug, placing the spark plug firing electrode at the proper depth, or keeping moisture out of the cylinder. What do you think about that one for a minute? Let's move on. Technician A says positive temperature coefficient thermistors increase their resistance as the temperature increases. Technician B says the temperature as the temperature decreases, negative coefficient thermistors reduce their resistance. Who is correct about that? A, B, both A, neither A. Both A and B, neither A and B. Question 3. Which sensor or circuit is not checked continuously on an OBD2 system? A, TP sensor, B, MAP sensor, C, ECT sensor, or D, O2 sensor heaters? Question 4. Conventional oxygen sensors don't work until A, they reach 600 degrees, B, the system is in closed loop, C, the torque converter is locked, or D, engine coolant temperature reaches 200 degrees. Question 5. Which of the following would not be considered a computer input? A, throttle position sensor, B, magnetic pulse generator, C, park neutral switch, or D, EGR vent solenoid. Question 6. All engines have some type of blank system. PCV, EGR, AIR, or heated hydrocarbon vent, HHV. Question 7. A lean air fuel mixture burns A. Cold and fast, B. Hot and fast, C. Hot and slow, or D. Cold and slow. I don't know why I've got bums here. I meant to put burns. Question 8. A fuel pump on a vehicle can be heard for two seconds at key on. But the engine will not start. The fuel gauge shows a full tank. Fuel pump current draw is 8.9 amps. Which of the following is least likely to be the cause? A. An empty fuel tank. B. Water in the fuel tank. C. An operative fuel injectors. Or D. Fuel fouled spark plugs. Question 9. If the idle air control counts are zero, A. The engine is running rich. B. The engine may have a vacuum leak. C. The throttle plates may need to be cleaned. Or D. Both B and C are correct. Question 10. An engine's running at 243 degrees. The cooling system's full of clean coolant. The air conditioner is off, but the fans cycled on at the proper engine coolant temperature. They never cycle off. Both heater hoses are cool to the touch. Of the following, which is the most likely to be the problem? Now you got to factor all these in. A stuck open thermostat, a bad water pump, too much heat transfer from the radiator to the ambient air, or too much hot gas EGR flow. Technician B says the output of a Hall effect sensor can be checked with an AC voltmeter. Technician B says the output of a variable reluctance sensor can be tested with a lab scope. Who's correct about that? A only, B only, B and C, or neither A or B. Question 12. What was one thing that OBD-1 regulations required after 1988 that was not previously required? A. A misfire monitor. B. An oxygen sensor. C. A dash-mounted warning light. Or D. A dash-mounted connector. Question 13. EGR system failure can cause higher cylinder combustion, pinging detonation, higher NOx emissions, or any of the above. 
Question 14. The technician has been led by diagnostic trouble codes to investigate fuel trim numbers that are as follows. Short fuel trim 1. Long fuel trim minus 25. Okay, the fuel filter may be restricted. The crankcase oil may be contaminated with fuel. The fuel pressure may be low or any of the above. Technician A says a bad radiator cap can cause rust and corrosion buildup in a car's cooling system. Technician B says the large pipe on a heater core is generally the heater core's inlet pipe. Call it. Who's right? Technician A, Technician B, both or neither. Technician A says injector firing frequency is directly tied to crankshaft sensor input. Technician B says on an engine with a crankshaft sensor and a distributor, improper distributor rotor alignment can be corrected by adjusting the ignition timing. Who is correct about that? Technician A, Technician B, both or neither. Question 17. A technician is investigating a no-start condition on a vehicle with the following PID values. IET 101, barometric pressure 28 inches of mercury, throttle position 8 tenths of a volt, engine coolant 45 degrees, transmission oil temperature 47 degrees, battery voltage 12 and a half volts. What's the most likely reason for the no start? Faulty barrel, weak TP sensor, open IET, none of the above. A five cylinder engine has a firing event how many degrees? Every how many degree? One, that's 45, 144, 120, or 180. The temperature stamped on the copper case of a thermostat's whack pellet is the temperature at which what happens? The thermostat is fully open, starts to open, is fully closed, or is modulating. The exhaust gas recirculation valve, when fully open, generally allows a little less and 10% of the exhaust gas to pass back through the intake mix. That's, uh, technician A says this is to reburn some of the exhaust gas. Technician B says this is done to cool the combustion chamber. Who's correct about that? A, B, both or neither. Technician A says late ignition timing can cause the speed density fuel injection system to run rich and force the fuel trim readings to the negative. Technician B says an erroneously low barrel reading will drive fuel trim figures to the positive. Who is correct? A, B, both, or neither. If the vehicle speed signal is suddenly lost at road speed, what generally happens? A, the speedometer needle drops to zero. B, the speed control suddenly becomes dysfunctional. C, the transmission drops back into first gear. Or D, all of the above. Question 23. If an engine with an automatic transmission is placed in drive with the brakes locked and the engine's accelerated to wide open throttle, what information might be gleaned from watching the stall speed on a tachometer? A. Whether the engine's producing the power it should. B. The condition of the one-way clutch in the torque converter. C. The boiling point of the engine oil. D. Either A or B. E. Either A or C. F. None of the above. Or G. All of the above. Question 24. A vehicle is traveling down a straight highway with short and long fuel trims hovering near zero. Suddenly a spark plug on bank 2 fails and begins misfiring. What will happen to the O2 sensor signal on that bank when this takes place? A. It will reflect a rich mixture. B. It will reflect a lean mixture. C. Fuel trims will go positive. D. Fuel trims will go negative. E. B and C. Or F. A and D. Last question, if you switch on the ignition and hear the fuel pump, you know what? A, the PCM's awake and functioning, B, the spark plugs are fouled, C, the injectors are clogged, or D, that there is at least fuel in the tank. Alright, now pay attention because we're going to grade this. We'll see how you did. The washer around the base of some spark plugs is there for conducting heat out of the plug. This is also true for the little bevel seat on the plug. It's supposed to conduct heat. That spark plug gets really hot. And the cylinder head, while it's the hottest part of the engine, needs to carry that heat out of those spark plugs so they don't burn up. In some cases, the plugs aren't screwed all the way in. They can get too hot. I've actually seen that kind of thing happen. 
not as common as it seems like it would be because of the fact that that washer is there for the purpose of it. Positive temperature coefficient thermistors will increase their resistance as the temperature increases, but negative temperature coefficient thermistors actually get less resistance the hotter they get. What that means is the voltage on that sensor has got 4.6 going to it usually. The voltage on that sensor will drop off because it's shorted away. As the sensor gets hotter, it gets less resistance and the voltage drops. So you're going to start out with like 3.5 volts or a real cold day and it's going to go down to like 0.45, you know, whenever the engine is nice and warm. The one that's not checked continuously is the O2 sensor heaters because certain conditions have to be met for those to be tested. Uh, your continuous monitor are the ones that are, they're supposed to be watched all the time. Like your TP sensor, if it drops out of range, it can catch that without certain conditions being met. Same way with your MAP or your ECT. Now you can have in-range failures on those, but it cannot consistently check the O2 sensor heaters unless certain conditions are met. That's the same with catalytic converter, fuel system, EGR, and so on. Those are actually only, that's how you have to have a, a good trip to reset all your monitors whenever you've done a repair and cleared the memory. Conventional oxygen sensors don't work until they reach 600 degrees. Uh, the wideband ones have to reach 1400 degrees. Which of the following would not be considered an input? That would be the EGR vent solenoid because it's an output, it's not an endpoint. A solenoid is not an input. It's never an input. It's always an output. All engines have some type of PCV system. They have to have crankcase ventilation because some of that blow-by gas is going to go by those rings and it's going to need to be dealt with. You don't let it out into the air, although some of the Dodge Cummins diesels still do, but the PCV system it's actually got to ventilate. If you had that thing just sealed up and there was no positive crankcase ventilation of some kind, even venting it to the outside, it would blow all the gaskets because the pressure in the crankcase would become excessive. If the PCV system is clogged up on both sides, it'll blow gaskets anyway. So if you have to replace all the gaskets and seals on an engine, you need to make doggone sure that you got an operational PCV system. A lean air fuel mixture burns hot and fast. Uh, and that's typically um, what this chart's about. You'll see that. You know, you got your your CO is going to be low right there, which is CO is carbon monoxide. That's oxides of nitrogen, which is going to be high in high temperatures. Hydrocarbons uh, are basically going to be, you know, whenever they're low and NOx is high, is the place where you got your best economy. And there's your closed root target range right there. Uh, that's a fairly common. Um, this one here came from Toyota, but that's a fairly common graph you'll see. Alright, the fuel pump on a vehicle can be heard for two seconds at key on. What that means is uh, the empty fuel tank is the least likely reason for that. If you take your fuel pump relay out and you know which wires bringing power into that relay and which one goes out of the pump, what you can do is take your little uh, meter and hook it on amps and just bypass that relay with that meter set on amps and however many amps the fuel pump is pulling will give you an idea of where it's pumping fuel or not. Now some of them pull less and more than others but if that thing's not starting even if it reads like it's got some gas in it and it's only pulling like one or one and a half amps then chances are your fuel tank is empty and the fuel pump is not pumping any fuel because it doesn't pull as many amps and it's not pumping fuel. Uh, I've seen the ones that are pumping fuel go from four to like nine amps, you know, typically, while it's pumping fuel. So those figures, you could fudge a little bit. If it's pulling almost no amps, it ain't pumping any fuel. If the idle air control counts are zero, the engine may have a vacuum leak. Well, what happens is it's, look, it's, look, it's got a target idle speed it's looking for. If there's a vacuum leak on these fuel-injected engines, you might think about carburetors running rough when they had a vacuum leak. Well, if the fuel injection has got a engine's got a vacuum leak somewhere where it's equally feeding vacuum to the whole plenum, it'll cause it to idle faster usually, unless it's really close to something like the, you know, an important, I mean, like an uh, intake port or something like that, where it's about to cause it to skip on one cylinder. But if it's skipping, if it's got a big uh, air leak or even a small air leak, it can cause that 
uh, idle to be high enough to where it'll be above the target or at it. And so it'll close, it'll try to bring that thing under control and it'll close those idle air control steps all the way down. And it, it can, if it gets in that dead band, which is what they call that, can totally stop using the idle speed control. Now most vehicles today uh, have got electronic throttle control. So this is a, this question uh, is, is most uh, suited for those that still have idle air control. Engine running at 245, coolant system full of clean oil coolant. You got to factor that in. Air conditioner's off, but the fan cycled on when it got to the range where it was supposed to, and they never cycled off. Both heater hoses are cool to the touch of the following, which is the most likely to be the problem. A bad water pump. If those heater hoses are cool to the touch, and you know it's full of coolant, there's no air in it, and you know the coolant is clean and it's good coolant, if there's not, and I, like I say, I like to pull the heater hose is loose and run a clear hose, you know, from hose to hose and crank it up and see if there's coolant flowing through there. It'll be just buzzing through there really fast or, or flowing through there really quick. Uh, if it's not or if it's got a bubble there or whatever, then chances are you're going to have a bad water pump. And I mean the impeller is rusted away or something like that, you know. Uh, technician A says the output of a Hall effect sensor can be checked with an AC voltmeter. B says the output of a variable reluctance sensor can be tested with a lab scope. Who's correct about that? A, B, it's going to be B on that one right there. Uh, you can't check the output of a Hall effect with AC voltmeter because an AC voltmeter only reads alternating current. It's not going to read anything because a Hall effect is always a direct current output. Right? Uh, OBD2 regulations required a dash mounted warning light beginning in 1988. That's when Ford put, first put one on there. Now Jeep managed to dodge that for another year or two. Uh, but for the most part, 88 was the drop dead um, deadline for that. EGR system failure can cause A, higher combustion chamber temperature, pinging, detonation. All of that can be caused by EGR system failure. Technicians have been led by DTCs to investigate fuel trim numbers that are if you're short fuel trim 1%, long fuel trim minus 25 the fuel filter may be restricted. Crankcase oil may be contaminated with fuel is the right answer to that, not this one. Uh, if the crankcase oil is contaminated with fuel, the PCV system will pick up on those vapors and pull it through there, and the oxygen sensor will get the signal that there's too much fuel there, and it will cut the fuel back to try to balance everything out. Now, once the long fuel trim, and see, initially the short fuel trim will actually go up to 25. When it can't handle it that way, it will start shifting the long fuel trim in, a, in slower steps until it gets them into the same place where the short fuel trim needed to be to keep it balanced. And it's holding the thing out of balance to make it run as clean as it possibly can. That's what short and long fuel trim is about. Technician A says a bad radiator cap can cause rust and corrosion. Building. It can. If air can just come and go, you're going to have rust and com com uh, com corrosion buildup. Uh, B says the large pipe on the heater core is the heater core's inlet. That's wrong. It's going to be the outlet. You basically want the big one to be the outlet so there will be no pressure on that heater core. You've got a smaller outlet than you do an inlet. It's going to be like when your water hose gets tight when you put your thumb over the end of it. It will swell up. You can bust a heater core hook them, them terminal, I mean them uh, hoses up wrong. Technician A says an injector firing frequency is directly tied to crankshaft sensor input. Technician B says on an engine with a crankshaft sensor and a distributor, improper distributor alignment can be corrected by adjusting the ignition timing. That's technician A only. There's an exception to this. The, uh, like I was, I was talking the other day on one of my videos, we had a Nextera. Uh, they had a crank sensor. It was only there for misfire detection, and it actually had adjustable timing. On the ones like on some of the Jeeps and on some of the Dodge pickups uh, the that have a distributor, uh, the only thing that's in there is the cam sensor. Uh, CSFI Chevrolet engines is like that, that spider fuel injection. And so if you turn the injector, I mean if you turn a distributor this way or that very much at all, you're going to get the rotor out of alignment. And uh, on those Chevy pickups, what that does, it causes them to get really lousy gas mileage. Somebody will say, I had an intake manifold gasket put on my uh, 96 Chevy pickup and uh, now the gas mileage is going to plot. Well, when it can't trust the uh, cam sensor, oh no, it bank fires the injectors, and that's not con that doesn't help with the gas mileage at all. Uh, I don't know how many times I've seen that. 
All right, this one here is the one we talked about the other day. You ought to know the answer to this one. That IAT totally disagrees with those two other temperature sensors when it's been sitting there. Uh, and it's going to be an open IAT sensor circuit. You remember, that's on your enhanced scan tool. It's going to lie to you about that temperature and show you the value it has, it has substituted instead of the 40 below that your OBD2 room is going to show you. Five cylinder engine's got to fire an event every 144 degrees. The way you figure that is you take 720 degrees and divide the number of cylinders into it. You can do that on any number of cylinders if it's a four cycle engine because it takes 720 degrees to do a full cycle. Temperature stamped on the copper base, that's when it starts to open. If it says 196 degrees Fahrenheit, it's starting to open at that temperature. The exhaust gas recirculation valve would fully open. That's a little less than 10% of the exhaust gas passed back through the mix. That is to cool the combustion chamber so you don't form oxides of nitrogen. Because whenever the nitrogen is actually the gas that expands and pushes a piston down when the combustion happens because nitrogen is an inert gas. But if the combustion chamber temperature goes over 2500 degrees, the oxygen and the nitrogen lock together in various different compounds. And that, that's got to actually be dealt with the way they deal with it. On some of the, uh, uh, you know, not every engine, uh, even back in the 80s, had EGR. Some of the 3 liters came, or 2.9 liters came without it. Some of the Jeeps came without it because they were able to satisfy emission requirements without an EGR valve. Uh, beginning in uh, 1995, the uh, Ford Contour had uh, variable cam timing on the exhaust camshaft. And it would close the exhaust valves a little early and just leave some of that gas in there. It was for dealing with oxides of nitrogen. Those didn't have an EGR valve on them. Ignition A says late ignition timing can cause a speed density fuel system to run rich and force the trim readings to the negative. All right, late ignition timing causes low vacuum. If it's a speed density system, it's going to have a MAP sensor. If the MAP sensor reads low vacuum, it's going to put more fuel in there. So what's that going to do, right? If the oxygen sensor picks up on it running rich for any reason, it's going to drive the fuel trims negative. Technician B says an erroneously low barrel reading will drive fuel uh, trim positive. A low barrel reading will make you put less fuel in there. When you're at high altitude, you don't need as much fuel. If you don't need as much fuel, all the only thing it knows is that it sees low, I mean, high altitude, low pressure. So it's going to put less fuel in there. Oxygen sensor picks up on that, adds more fuel to compensate. Fuel trim numbers are, numbers are driven to the positive. Always pay attention to those things when you're troubleshooting a fuel trim issue. If the vehicle speed signal is suddenly lost at road speed, what generally happens? All of that can happen. Phenometer needle drop. Anything that depends on the speed speedometer signal can do that. If an engine with an automatic transmission is placed in drive with a brake slot, the engine accelerated wide open throttle, what information can be gleaned from watching the stall speed on the tachometer? That's what the point at which the RPM stops rising and everything is just held static there. Uh, you can actually tell either A or B. Uh, if, you, if the one-way clutch in the torque converter is not good, the stall speed will be too high. Um, and so uh, you don't want the, uh, well, I take that back. Uh, the stall speed will be too low. What happened, we were actually working on a uh, expedition one time trying to get it to misfire. And when we really, when we did the uh, stall, you know, we'd hold the brakes and lock the park brake and get on it. Uh, the stall speed on that was supposed to be 2900 and it was at like 1800, uh, which told us that the torque converter was bad. Uh, but if the engine's underpowered for some strange reason, you'll also have a low stall speed. So, Make sure there's actually specs in most of the books about where the stall speed is supposed to be. Um, so that's going to be either A or B. Vehicles traveling down a straight highway with short, long fuel trims hovering near zero like you're supposed to be. Spark plug on bank two starts to misfire. B and C. It'll reflect a lean mixture and fuel trims will go positive. That will happen if you get one that's doing that. Um, and the reason for that is that oxygen sensor is not smelling fuel. It couldn't care less about fuel uh, on most of the runs with conventional sensors anyway. And so this particular one, uh, when it picks up on that, it's going to smell the air 
it's going to increase the fuel. In spite of the fact that there's a bunch of unburned fuel blowing past that sensor, it couldn't care less about that. So it's going to see the air that didn't burn along with that mix, and it's going to jack the uh, fuel trims out of, you know, try to richen it up and fix that. If you switch on the ignition and hear the fuel pump, you know the PCM is awake and functioning. That's what I always used to teach my student. You got a no start, first thing you want to do, if you got good battery power, switch on the key. Don't try to start it, just switch on the key and see if you hear the fuel pump run for two seconds. If you do, the first thing you know, that eliminates some things. You know the engine controller is awake and it's able to turn on the fuel pump. If you don't hear anything, then you're going to need to take another route. But if you switch that key on and that fuel pump goes, you know the engine controller is awake anyway. And, you know, that'll keep you from having to do some unnecessary tests. Well, I hope you got something out of this. hope you enjoyed it and uh, as, as much as I enjoyed presenting it. And uh, until next time, I'm signing off.